So without further ado, let's start. Um, math discourse in a blended learning environment. Um, so wherever we may be in September, a lot of us, we have an idea where we're gonna be, but we're not really sure. So we're gonna try to make the most of what we do get to have. So questions, <clears throat> what we're actually gonna just try to answer in this session is uh, uh, focus on these following questions is what is math discourse? Uh, what are the benefits of math discourse? What are some practical ways to encourage math discourse? And what are some digital tools to help make math discourse engaging um, both in the classroom and online? So it doesn't just have to be done at home. It could be in the classroom as well if you are equipped with such technology. So what is math discourse? Simply it's mathematical communication that occurs in the classroom or virtual classroom or wherever you are discussing it. Um, of course, it can be we can go a little bit more in depth with this. I'm curious about what your thoughts are on math discourse. So what you can do is in the chat box, just write down a, a statement or a phrase what you think math discourse is or what it might look like in your classroom. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Okay, don't all jump at, at it once. Chat box, oh, here we go. Discussing student answers and strategies to open-ended questions. Thanks, Anne. And I got to say, Anne LeBlanc is uh, was a nice promo fan for me for this, which was I thank her for that. <laughs> Let's give you a few more seconds on that. Ask the right questions, you get them talking. That's right. Finding out their understanding, finding out prior knowledge. Excellent. So what we can do is um, I'll just. Go ahead here on the next slide and through uh, NCTM, some of the information that they have here is um, some bullet points on it. Um, what math discourse is, purposeful uh, exchange of ideas, uh, purposeful being a keyword there. Um, verbal, visual, and written communication. So it's not all about, it doesn't have to just be discourse like communication talking. It can be what are they writing down? What are they showing you? Um, um, it could even be, um, you know, they can make a movie about something and that's a way of communicating an idea. Uh, opportunities to share ideas and clarify, clarify understandings. And that's a big one. Uh, a lot of times, especially in the share process, students listen to each other and actually start to have a better understanding of what is uh, what's happening in the math class just through that conversation. And constructing construction of convincing arguments as well. Um, so they're going beyond <clears throat> surface and they're going a little bit deeper and making sure that they have uh, able to back up their ideas. Figuring out why and how things work. And of course, developing, developing mathematical language. So the more we, we talk and have the discourse in math class, the more uh, they'll have a better understanding of how to use certain vocabulary. And of course, um, um, be able to communicate their ideas a little bit more uh, clearly. And of course, the, the last one I really like is seeing things from other perspectives. So it's not like a right, wrong all, all the time, even though there might be one answer, how we get there could be a multitude of different ways. Um, for me, a lot of times the mathematics is more of the, the journey than the destination. And I think um, for children to be able to see things from others, uh, other perspectives is extremely important. So of course, the, the benefits of math discourse, if we just look back at the, the last seven points. If you just think about it, you're like, oh, those are, all are really good things, you know? Um, if you go back, like developing mathematical language or being able to have purposeful exchange of ideas, these are all great. And of course it encourages um, student interaction. And a lot of times you could go into a classroom and you might see no one talking. Um, and I always say quiet is not engaged. Um, and if they can communicate their ideas and have that open discourse, it's going to make not only is their interactions be better, they're going to also address the gaps in student understanding, um, but they're going to have a little, little bit more fun as well. And of course, uh, 
math discourse helps students express mathematical concepts more deeply and precisely and it's through that feedback loop that we're going to have when we discuss things and talk and share that we get a better understanding of what we're doing and the last one um, probably most important especially in the younger and even in high school, even adults, I would say, is it builds that confidence. So when you actually have a good understanding of what you're talking about, you feel good. Setting up the classroom culture, so or the virtual classroom uh, for discourse, needs to be based on respect and acceptance, safe, risk-free environment, and of course, this leads to having them feel comfortable um, to be able to offer responses for discussions, questioning themselves and their peers and investigating new strategies. So not having the fear of, of being wrong or um, being outed because they have a certain way of looking at it um, or not, right? So, um, and I think this is one thing, it should just be a very open, like words can flow. Um, and very student led and it will give uh, and the same thing if you're going to have to be online then what you would want to do is make sure that um, that the the respect is there and how you have rules like say you're using a Google Meet such as this you know um, being um, building off other people's ideas and you know disagreeing respectfully as well so whether in a classroom virtual classroom they have to have those uh, the norms set for that um, so, ways to promote math discourse, um, of course, is giving daily opportunities. They need lots of uh, opportunities to and experiences to do this, such as like number sense routines, number talks, small group, large group activities and games, share time during a three-part lesson, it's crucial. Um, and um, as mentioned earlier by some of you, open-ended tasks uh, and questions that encourage problem solving and promote creative um, strategies. And of course, use culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, giving students the the chance um, should be a chance to connect personal experiences to the math topics. So you know, having them create their own story problems that is it's relevant to what they're doing in their life or what they're using. Um, and of course, getting into like at the bottom I have music and movement. Um, kids like to move. I like to move personally too. I'm pretty kinesthetic and there's a way to do it. Whether you're in the classroom or even at home, uh, you can promote these things. So the next part of the presentation is going to get into just showing um, some ways that things that I've used and also things that we can use going forward. Um, uh, tools that to help promote um, math discourse and um, we'll discuss them as we go along. Um, so when looking at music movement and games, um, I don't know what your kids are like in your classroom, but mine had always been they have to move. Um, if you're not using it, I, I suggest you check it out. Um, Number Rock is a great uh, YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe to it through YouTube. Um, and they have a lot of great math stuff. Whoops, sorry. And what we're going to do is I actually want to show you just a little clip of a video um, that I used in a classroom. And it's uh, the area model of multiplication. It's pretty catchy. So if you want to sing along, you can. And I just want to make sure you can hear the video. Just anyone give me a yes if you can. Great, excellent. So I just um, wanted to show that to you because I, I found it um, 
a very good way to kind of introduce some concepts or to help with some of the visuals and so solidify some understandings. Um, I was in a grade five, four or five class and for the fives we we're doing area models in two, two time two digit uh, multiplication. And when I showed that they were like, every they were chanting for the song to come on and they would sing and dance to it and it was neat because they're talking about partial products and all the things that we're discussing in the class and because of things like that they the math discourse it came kind of like a more relaxed uh, classroom setting now if we're not in the classrooms come fall because if the pandemic or whatnot things like the this can be uh sent home through whether you're using Google Slides or a doc or even a link in an email, um, kids can have access to these uh, these songs at home as well. Um, another great thing to um, promote discourse in the classroom would be using uh, movement around the classroom outside, possibly a little bit more of that uh, uh, this com coming fall and or around the house. So here's like walk and talks where instead of if you're propose or proposing questions to them, they can be put up around the room so students can walk around um, in groups spaced out, I guess, depending on that or maybe even outside uh, to get more space. Um, and playing mental math games, of course, allows for movement and more relaxed environment, fostering natural um, math discourse. Um, if kids are at home, uh, they can always use uh, dice or cards at home or I have a link here that has uh, digital dice and cards. Um, and there's tons on, on the internet for such things. But instead of doing, you know, like um, math minutes and things like that, they can actually play a lot of great games. Um, and if you actually have any questions about a lot of games like that, uh, tweet me on Twitter or something, or you can like uh, message me. And um, I have a lot of resources like that. As I see, I know a lot of people in the chat box here that probably have that stuff too. Um, and another thing, um, getting into like music and movement and that of course is the, the hands-on um so we have to be thinking a little bit about what are we going to do if we are not in the classroom um but we want to still have kids use uh manipulatives and there's a lot of digital manipulatives here the mathlearningcenter.org has uh, wonderful um manipulatives and um i was just in chad williams um session before this and he was talking about how some of them have now become a more of a, a shared ability so um here's a perfect example i'd like to show you so um the number pieces is called the base 10 with the mathlearningcenter.org, it can be an um, iPad app, it can be on Chromebook, um, on a computer, um, devices like that. And what's really great to say about something like this um, is I might be able to propose this and I'm gonna show you on here. So now what you can do is, so I have 123 and I've represented it as such with flat two rods and, and three uh, small units here small cubes so what i have is 120 123 and then what i can do is i can share it whether the link or uh, give students a share code um, and they can go on mathlearningcenter.org and what you would do with that code is i'll just show you here is they can hit the key and then they can um, put that key in there and then they will get this um, exact image that what I have um, but then what they can do is if let's say the task is can you take 123 and represent it differently than I did then what they can do is put in the key or get the link they get this exact screen that I have and then can manipulate it any way they want and then what they do is when they're done manipulating it they hit share and their code will be different. It'll be a different code and they can copy that code or copy the link and they could send it to you and show you the work that they did. Um, every time a, a change is done on this, it will create a new code. So if you were to send out um, this image with this code, um, multiple people can work on it. And as they work on it, it creates all these new codes. Um, the only thing with this is that you don't really get to see what they're doing when they're doing it. You just kind of see the finished product. Uh, something similar to this. Um, 
of course, the discourse can happen with that, though I see you did this, tell me why you did that. Um, and then they can communicate that way. Uh, another thing is possibly using Google Slides and having uh, many slides being created and they can all, you know, once you, once you have some manipulatives put in the slides that they could actually create their own slides. Um, they're only, they're a different way of uh, representing say 123 and then in, in real time, if they're all working on the, the same Google slide at the same time, you can go from uh, different slide to slide and you can actually see what everyone's doing in real time. So you can have it synchro uh, synchronous or asynchronous depending on what you uh, need. So this is kind of neat though. I just found out today about some of the shareability and I want to thank uh, Chad Williams for that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, the manipulatives are going to be very important as well as some other um, wonderful websites out there. I'm sure many of you know these and uh, these are just, you know, five that I, and there's some others that I, I like to use a lot um, to help foster math discourse. So such things like Estimation 180, where there's uh, little videos and you can watch and then uh, kids can, um, you know, estimate the high and low estimation that would make sense. Watch the video, see how close you are. And then the next video will have something compared to that. So they can like use that as a referent for the next thought. Uh, Steve Wyberney has tons of stuff, Splat. Um, SD mysteries are great here. There's a little snapshot of that where he'll give clues and based on the clues, you, tr you try to narrow down to how many I items are in the bowl or in the dish or whatever. Um, same or different, similar or would you rather, um, you're given choices and students have to um, maybe do some problem solving or like it's more of an open-ended question where they have to think about oh I'd rather have this size cake versus this size cake and then of course talk about the strategies why would you want that and then it'd be interesting how necessarily getting more cake isn't always the best thing for them personally I don't even like sweets so I'd be like oh, I want the smaller cake but if you can explain how your cake is smaller based on say dimensions or something like that it still has really good uh, conversations um, in fact, what we're going to do right now is we're going to do um, one of these. We're going to do which one does not belong. All of these pictures here have links directly to those websites, so you can use that. Um, and in order to do which one does not belong, we're going to use um, this Jamboard. Um, and I see Melina just put the Jamboard link down below there. So you guys can click on the Jamboard link and it's going to open up. Uh, Jamboard's a great collaborative tool and I'm sure lots of other people are using it uh, during this summer learning academy. Um, it can be both in the class or online and you can have multiple Jamboards if you want to create small group work and, and then sh and shared with the class and, and also have it discussed. So I'm just going to show you here if everyone's there I already see lots of you in the Jamboard. What I'd like you to do is grab a sticky, like just grab a sticky from over here and then write in which number does not belong of the four. There's no right or wrong answers, just based on what your rule is. I'm sure many of you have played this before. So 17 might not fit in that group of four numbers for some reason, whatever you might have. Okay, so if you can grab a sticky note and see what happens. There we go. Ooh, look at that. 65 does not belong because the digits don't add up to eight. It's great when you can see that and you can talk right there, talk about digits, the sums of the digits and things like that. 17 is a prime number. Won't be doing that in grade one. Grade six, of course, they're talking about primes and you can talk about that. Even in grade five when they're doing uh, area, how you can only have uh, maybe two dimensions that work to get a number 44. It's the only one where the tens and ones digits are the same. Excellent. Give you a couple more minutes to maybe add some more if you might have something creative. And as you can see, this doesn't have to necessarily be like, 
you know, you could, you could give this away, um, like send it home and it could be, um, a link and then people can add to it. But even in the classroom, if you have the technology, um, it's possible to do little breakout jam boards and, um, maybe give, um, various, um, different, which one does not belong to different groups and each group can do it. And then from here, you could just display this right on, um, uh, through an overhead onto your whiteboard or smart board, board whatever you have. Um, and if you do have a smart board and you're in the classroom or Mimeo, then you can actually like manipulate this right on the screen. Students can come up to and do things. Let's move this over. Excellent. 17 doesn't belong because it is the only number that doesn't contain an even number. So if when you're looked, looking specifically at the digits as well, yeah, very good. So you can see something very simple with this, which which one does not belong also has things like um, it could have shapes, fractions, graphs, tons of things. I, in fact, what would be good too is um, after doing a few of these is have your students create some of these. Um, and you could it could be... Uh, maybe just pictures of pattern blocks, which one does not belong. And it might be as simple as, oh, it's a different color or, um, you know, it has vertices versus no vertices, like a circle or something. So a lot of great things like that. All right. So I'm just going to move on a little bit. So this is just another tool. So just like we did, you, you can use the chat box, you can use Jamboard to communicate um, uh, more um, synch synchronously if you are online or in the classroom as such. Um, so another thing, another tool, of course, to use Google Classroom. Um, I'm not sure how many people use it. Um, it is a great tool to organize a lot of things and it's a good uh, vehicle uh, to run everything through, whether it's Docs, Slides, um, even Jamboard as such, uh, Google Meets as well. Um, through Google Classroom, you could have your regular uh, classroom Google Meet meeting if you're at, if you got to do a virtual classroom. Um, and even on the very basic way of doing this, instead of having um, some teachers have gone really in depth with their use of Google Classroom, uh, you can just have simple questions and even converse um, just like this. You could do put out a question and even put it on the board. And I've done this before because um, we school I was at, everyone had a Chromebook. So it was just getting them used to, you know, accessing it and talking. But you could just put up a question like, what is 426 subtract 273? And then you can like click on student answers. And then as they're answering, all their answers will be going up just like a live chat and then you can have it so that students can respond to other students um, and what I found was interesting is that students would do their work and answer questions and then there'd just be this live like um, almost like a, like a chat room of talking about this uh, expression here and the comments were always kind to each other it goes oh I, I never thought of it like that or that's a great idea um, and they were always just, it was really nice to see how they were talking to each other. And this could be done in the classroom, could be done like at home, of course. Um, so Google Classroom is, is one way of going. Um, and so I have, I got tons to show you today. And I just want to kind of give you a good taste of like a lot of the tools that we have access to, and then kind of think like what works for you, what's your style of teaching and then go from there with that. Um, again, um, all these slides will have links to, and you can go further into what you need to do. Um, the other thing just to make mention is that uh, Google uh, apps for education is uh, province wide in Nova Scotia. So all of those e-resources um, you have access to and are allowed to use. Um, some things I will show you today, um, um, are not approved by all regions, um, but I know a lot of the regions are uh, working to uh, accommodate people and um, pushing forward new technology uh, through the DRA, so uh, Digital Resource Assessment, um, as they see fit, if you, can, if you have a good argument for using one, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but Google Meet is wonderful. As you can see, we're doing it right now. I'm able to show you a lesson or a presentation um, or if we 
you know, we're all on video, we could all be talking just like in a classroom. Um, another one, a great thing to do with Google Meet is that Jamboard's not approved. Okay, yeah. So hopefully that will get there soon. Um, and at the end, I have a link where you can even like talk to some people about the, uh, um, see if they can push things along. Cause I know there's kind of a lineup with that kind of thing. Um, but Google Meet's great too, whoops, sorry. Um, because you can run a lot of smaller group work. So just like you would have in a classroom where you have like say four or five tables and the kids are talking, maybe you give them some um, work, some questions, and then they're all working out a strategy together. Um, then you will you would, you would step in, you know, stop by each group and see how they're doing and listen to the conversations and their discourse. And then, you know, at the end, have everyone share and everyone be better for it. So if we're at home, one thing you can do is use Google Meet and kind of create Google Meet breakout rooms. So the way that kind of works is like you just create your groups, create several Google Meets and the, and link them to different groups. Um, I'll have an example on the next page. Students simply find their name on it. So maybe just like in a Google slide like this, you can give them a Google slide, they find their name, they click on it, and at a certain time they'll have to meet. And then you can just jump in from uh, Google Meet to Google Meet, pop in, just like you would be going around group to group. Um, and it's basically giving them an opportunity in a small group format to, to discuss their ideas. And then, yeah, just reuse the same links and say, just like we're same groups, or if you have to move groups around because they're not getting along, just like in a classroom, it's possible. But this is the way it might look. So. Um, it might just be a, just like this, a slide that says, find your name and click on it to access your breakout room. Discuss the following problem with your group. Then we will come back to our large group and discuss what your groups came up with. And of course, question or problem is like you post whatever the question or problem is. And then here, all you would have to do is, um, so maybe there's breakout, you have four breakout rooms. It'd be nice to only have 16 students, but it's not always the case. And, oh, I'm student A. So I click on this and then I, I will be taken right to that link and then you can go in there. Um, so you would just link, you would have four different breakout rooms like Google Meets. And if you are the teacher, perhaps what you would do is open them all up and then just have them on the top of your window as different tabs. And then you just pop into each one and see what they're doing. Uh, for a little bit more detail on it, I've linked um, Greg uh, Kuluiek, um, who is who's done, does a lot of this stuff on, on YouTube to explain it. And he's got a great video of step by step how to do this, but it is, it's not too difficult to do. Um, and then from there, what you can do is use the slide again, change the question, and then have another breakout room. Um, and then come back to the normal big group uh, meet and then say, oh, when I was in, uh, you know, group two, this is what they were talking about. Any other group? What, what do you guys do? So it's just another way to, you know, kind of get that small group feel of a classroom at home if needed. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, Google Slides and Docs, we can all use those. And I'm using Google Slides right now, of course. Um, just a great way to present a lot of things. Um, differentiating questions uh, to create great discussions. Um, and an example might be this. So I, what I like to do a lot of times um, as a math coach, if I'm, if I'm presenting a lesson or modeling a lesson, what I would do is I'd use a, a Google Slides just to have a few questions maybe up there. And what I like to do, like for example, uh, pizza challenge. I live in Dartmouth. Yeah, yes, pizzas is excellent. So I go, yeah, yes, pizza has just made 24 pizzas for a party. Each pizza has eight slices. 195 people are coming to the party. Is there enough pizza for everyone to get a slice? How do you know? Um, so this could be presented to students. Um, they can, you know, uh, do their work. So if, if you're in a classroom, what I also do is my, I have Google Drive connected to my phone and with this, I would go around and take pictures of the students' work as they're working on this. And there's a few examples right here. And then I can quickly like 
connect it to this slideshow, I just add a slide or two and I will just insert picture and it'll say recent and then you just drop in those photos right into your into your slideshow. So at the beginning of the slideshow, they'll have the question and then as the work is getting completed, they'll start seeing their work show up on the um, on the overhead and that will give students a lot of um, a way to uh, show off their work and talk about the different ways here. There's four different ways. Um, some are not as efficient. I think they were skip counting by eight here or something so and they said they lost track and then with all the different ways this is uh, allows you to um, plan which way you want to go with the with the answers as well to, to kind of uh, you know steer people maybe if you want to steer students into a certain strategy whether it is maybe doing um, partial products or something like that but it's a great way just if you have an overhead and you're using slides or something like that um, putting their work up, it, it's a nice way to uh, to kind of show it off. I know some people might use Apple TV and there's some other ways to um, get things up onto a screen or such. Um, one thing I've used is Flipgrid. Um, this is not approved by um, all regions, but by a few, I know four or five do it. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, another way of, of doing something like this. Um, this can be done in the classroom or online. Um, it's a wonderful, easy to use app for empowering the voice of your learners. So what's great about this is you can give them some ideas, what you want them to do, or give them a quick video, a quick question, and then they can just hear it, respond, and make, and you can limit how big the, the video answer is so if you just want to say you have one minute tell me what your thoughts are and then they can do that and they can also respond to other people as well you have you can control the settings on that um, so they can watch responses of others reply so what I'm gonna do I have a, a link there you can check out Flipgrid as well um, on your own it's it's not hard to use uh, but uh, here's an example of using um, a call and response Let's see, just make sure this works here. Hi everyone, I have an addition expression for you to solve today. It's 128 plus 383. Take a minute to think about it, use a personal strategy and get back to me with your response with a quick video. Talk to you soon, take care. Um, so what we did is uh, for our, our math uh, team, we were, talking about number talk. So I said, here's an interesting thing we can try. As you can see, the same background as where I am right now, still in my office, so <laughs> all this time. And then from that, they they will get, um, you're in a group or like your class will have, like there's a code that, and then they can go on it and respond to the question. And similar to how like Google Classroom would work. And then here's a couple of response, responses based on that question. So as you can see, um, if people want to talk it out, it's quite easy to do. They can write, draw it, write it out, um, and then they have that voice that we want those students to have. Here's one more response. 128 plus 383. Well, I thought what I would do was uh, forget about the ones moment because I noticed that if I did that, it'd be 120 plus 380. And I like how that 20 and 80, I know that makes another 100 using my sort of make 10 or make 100, uh, what I know about that. So uh, 120 plus 300, 100 and 300 is 400, 20 plus 80 is another 100, so 500. And then I add on that 11 that I, those ones that I took off at the beginning, 511 equals 500. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> David always cracks me up. I love the way he explains that. 
Um, so with, as you can see, it's it was very easy to use. Um, and wonderful thing about that is just having those little video talks and kids today love doing like little videos and there's lots of different um, apps and websites out there. And as long as, you know, it's approved and you can use it, it's great. Um, or even sometimes what you might do is send home some information. Um, mom or dad, take a little video of them, send that video, th even if it has to be through email or whatever, it, it can come back to you. Um, with this, though, what's great is that other students can see it and have discussions. Um, you could come back um, in a Google Meet if um, with this information and look at some of the videos and talk about, oh, listen to these person's strategies. Uh, what do you guys think about that? And then, you know, talk about and compare and, and just, uh, it just kind of opens up um, and creates a bigger toolbox for all the students. Uh, another website um, or an application as well that I, I've used, um, again, certain uh, regions are allowed to use Class Dojo. Um, it's a fantastic website and app for sharing, communicating, engaging, learning. I put the link here for you. Um, what's kind of neat about it is over time, it's kind of developed. It's almost kind of like um, a private Facebook for your class um, where you can um, present sim similar, just like Flipgrid, you can create a video as such, um, send it out, it says listen to the video and comment with a response. You can draw pictures if that helps you. Um, and there's like a lot of like um, like stickers and drawing and everything, Class Dojo. Um, and what's great about this too is um, if you look up here in portfolios, students are able to um, in their own portfolio, take pictures of their work or videos of the work that they're doing, and then send it to their parents. The parents can see, comment, like it, whatever. Um, and it, it's really, it really increased the engagement uh, of math and math discourse in my classroom, but also um, the communication with home um, of really knowing what's going on in class. And they were able to discuss these, um, what we did in class a little bit more. Cause, oh, I saw what you did. So tell me more about it. Cause a lot of kids that you go home, what'd you do? Nothing. Well, no, I saw you, you were actually doing something. So it kind of, um, you know, holds them a little bit more accountable. And actually after I started using this and other uh, manipulative uh, webs, web apps and things like that to, um, to increase the communication tools um, or the ability to communicate with home, uh, I found that students wanted to do more work and, you know, it's kind of like the, the whole media world for them. Um, and then here's just a, a simple way of using it as well in class. I would, they would just do work, take a pic of it and post it and then Every every um, everything that they would post or whatever as as the teacher the administrator of the classroom, um, I would have to approve it as well. So nothing bad would happen, I guess. Um, but what was really wonderful with them um, with this is that you could just put it, post it, um, and then I would have maybe Class Dojo up on my screen, and then we can see their work just like you could, like if I was using Google Slides and took a picture and, and put it on the presentation. So it's just another way for them to explain it. But as you can see here. Six times six equals 36. And then this is their, that's nice. You got it. I did multiplication. So it, it kind of just adds to their confidence as well when you're able to display their work and then be able to talk about it to their friends. Um, and you can say, oh, I see we did. Tell me more about it. And then have others have those discussion pieces. So this is, it was, it was really good during the share part. Um, one more thing I just want to show you uh, Book Creator. Um, also, in some regions, we can use this. Um, a lot of times it's used in literacy, but I feel that it can be used a, a, a great deal more for mathematics. Um, it's a great way to archive their work. You, as a, for a free account, you're limited, I think, to so many books, maybe it's 40. Um, but all I've said to students is you have one book, but the book is unlimited and you can just turn it into whatever you want, whether stories or whatever, but even a math journal, it's a great way of, of doing it. And um, it gives a voice again, because with it, you can do recordings, videos, photos, text, import media. Um, there's text to voice capabilities as well. Um, and here's a link for that. If you want to take a look at that, I think someone was uh, presenting on it as well. But so this is what I might do in Book Creator. And 
because in my library, all your students can see your book. And it's called A Day at the Park, brought in some pictures. And with this, it says, I could not believe all the dogs I saw at the park yesterday. When I first got there, there were 48 dogs. After some time, a bunch of dogs went home for lunch. Then there were only 19 left. How many went home? So, um, and this here is, I can record what, I, I can record this. So if students are having a hard time reading, say, a word story, I can record it and put that in there. And then when they open the book, they just click on this uh, um, voice button and it will read it to them. In my, I can, you know, and you can do it like uh, extravagantly, um, have it like, I could not believe all the dogs I saw at the park yesterday. So you can have fun with it. Um, so then my direction, of course, is in your own book, title the page, day at the park, and it's like a journal. So respond to it. And they can add pictures and they can do it like a comic. Um, they can bring in, they can take a video of them explaining it. They can take, uh, use manipulatives, take a picture of it. And it's a wonderful way to have it. And then they get to have a math, it's like a virtual math journal as well. Um, and similarly, um, if you can't use Book Creator in your region, you could do something similar to this. Um, you could do a Google Slides and kind of create a math journal. And each slide might be a day that you're using and because you can bring in pictures and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then they could just kind of create um, an archive of their work. Because um, a lot of times I notice it when it, it's great to use books. And um, so this is both in school and at home, but it's, it's great to use books and pencil on and write things down. Um, but it gives them a little bit of a choice too. Um, and also has the uh, voice to text um, can help be a helpful tool. Um, or if you just want to use this, um, if book creator is not something you can use in your region, you could just use this as a presentation um, and where students may not have their own account with it linked up to your account because um, that's really the only part why book creator is not allowed in some regions it's through um, because when students sign in so anything where students have to sign in you have to just make sure that that is um, approved by your region um, but if you just want to use it as a presentation tool then just like showing something on this on a, like a slideshow even that this could be used um, so just quickly show you this, the e-learning support. So at the end, if you click on this, it does tell you um, through the Nova Scotia government here, it does tell you, all has all your regions and it tells you what um, items are approved. And if you click on this, this will tell you, show you your, your uh, contacts for your, your tech help desk and everything, um, depending in your region. and. They're, they're trying to put through as many as possible um, supports that we can use, especially in this time of need. We need a lot more uh, digital support. Um, so I, I think with that too is, is if you do find something that you're like, well, I really like how this could be used in math. We can't, we don't have it approved. Contact them and, and see if something can happen because you could help push that along as well. So they just have to do an assessment on it to make sure it is safe for the kids and, um, and it, then it can be approved. And once it's approved, then you can use it.